Today we're going to finish up the series we've been looking at over the last few weeks entitled Kingdom Living in the Day-to-Day. I've subtitled this message today, Redefining the Moral High Ground. And that's exactly what you'll see our Savior doing. We'll still be in Matthew chapter 5. I actually had to change my message focus a little bit as I read more and more in this amazing chapter 5 and felt we had to deal with this particular uh, group of verses that we're going to see today. We'll be looking at Matthew 5, verse 21 through 48. And you can get ready for that and turn there if you have a Bible. Something I'm calling the six high water marks for conduct in the kingdom. Now remember, we have established that we're living in a spiritual kingdom. It will manifest itself, I feel, later in, in reality, a real kingdom. But now it's a spiritual kingdom. Remember the Lord Jesus was the one that said, My kingdom is not of this world. So it's not a worldly kingdom, it's not an earthly kingdom yet, but it is a kingdom, and it is in a spiritual uh, sphere that we operate. We are living in a spiritual kingdom with a king, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. It's good to remember that, and really this colors our day-to-day activity. Remember the title, Kingdom Living in the Day-to-Day. How do we manifest a kingdom life, a spiritual life, in obedience to the Lord, in the world we live in, with all of its limits and all of its um, injustices and all of the things that we don't like about the world. How do we live and how do we shine? Last week we talked about you being lights in the world, you being the salt of the earth, that flavor that people want. We should be manifesting those, those things. And, and we went through all the Beatitudes, so-called those blessings, the nine blessings last week. You could review that message. Today, though, we're going to look at that passage I mentioned in chapter 5. And I'll have to say there are some verses in the Bible that just cause you to take a step back and ponder. And Matthew 5, 20 is one of those for me. That's where the Lord said to the Pharisees and to everybody, really, to me, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, that's really what I call raising the bar. What do you mean, your righteousness exceeding that of the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the ones in the Old Testament uh, Mosaic system, and into the New Testament, of course, as the Lord knew them, They were operating under the Mosaic law. All the people were at that time, including the Lord himself. And I suppose as you look at the law, and if you read it, you'll find out that everything is meticulously stated as to how you're supposed to do it. Well, we know all about the offerings, sacrifices, all the feast days, the holidays, the kosher food. It tells you how to eat, even tells you how to go to the bathroom, if you can find that in there tells you what to dress like, how to deal with your neighbor. Everything is just all spelled out in meticulous detail. And I suppose if you had the big checklist in front of you, you might be able to check off the boxes and be blameless. Well, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He tells us in the book of Philippians. And he said that as to the righteousness which is by the law, blameless. He was blameless. So the Lord says here, if you want to uh, function in this kingdom and enter into the kingdom of heaven, as he puts it, your righteousness has to exceed that kind of righteousness that the Pharisees were operating under. And that's exactly what we're going to see today, because these six high watermarks are really drawn from the Ten Commandments and some other portions of the law. And you're going to hear him say, You have heard it said, and that's going to immediately take their minds back to the scriptures as they knew them, but he's going to state the, the, uh, the, the legal requirement, and then he's going to give you a higher, a much higher value. It's going to raise the bar, as I said. I recently saw a YouTube video a couple days back, and you might have seen this guy. He's a street preacher who does apologetics, where he'll go to campuses and students can just fire away and ask questions, usually really hard questions. 
And this one girl asked him, what are the requirements to get to heaven? And he said, perfection. Well, she said, is anyone perfect? And he said, no, no one is perfect. And then she asked, are there people in heaven? He goes, yes. Well, she had to backtrack and she said, well, if the requirements to get to heaven are perfection and no one is perfect and there are people in heaven, how do they get there? And his answer was grace. Grace. And I want you to remember that word as we look at this uh, portion of scripture today. We are not under a legal system and never have been. And so we must understand as we seek to walk in the favor of God, that he looks on us with favor. We are accepted in the beloved. We already have a standing with him. It was achieved by the Lord Jesus himself, and nothing can change that. And so as you look at these passages we'll look at today, keep that in mind. And we want to strive to please our master, to please our king. He is such a kind and forgiving and wonderful king. And we need to walk in his ways. And so remember that as we take a look at this passage this morning. You've heard that it was said, and he, and he prefaces each of these six by that phrase. You've heard that it was said. So that would ring a bell to them. They say, yeah, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, right. Do, that you, sh you shall not murder or kill. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Well, they knew all about that. We know all about that. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not kill. That's pretty basic. That's external. And so you could easily say, and, and people have said when you, when you talk about sin, you talk about moral conduct and, and things that are pleasing or not pleasing to God, uh, they'll say, well, geez, I never killed anybody. Like you get points for that? You never killed anybody. Well, how about this? But I say, if you're angry with your brother, you'll be liable to the judgment. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's an internal thing. You don't even know if I'm angry. I could walk around with anger to other people, and, and I think we all have. I think I mentioned it last week. Everybody has a short fuse, you know. Every night something can happen uh, to us in a, in a moment. It could be, you, know, you think, a road rage, but it could be other things. It could be your boss. It could be your wife, your husband, your children. You could get angry at your children. You can carry anger in your heart. And what's, this is going to be harder than I thought, what's going, to, what's going to happen to that? What is really happening when you're angry with somebody? What does Jesus say? You might, you just killed him. That's, that's raising the bar. So we have to ask ourselves and check ourselves about these internal things that are going on in our lives. He also talks about external things like slander, and they use this word, uh, say, raka. I guess that's some expression that they knew in Aramaic. It was a, it was a disdain, and where you could say, "You fool." You ever called anybody a fool? Uh, and and if you do that, you're liable of judgment. He says. Now I'm not, I'm not sure what Jesus means by all of that, like the fires of hell or something. Those, those are things we could discuss, but. Anger is something we need to address. And you have other verses that say it. It's not just the Sermon on the Mount. You can't just throw this away and say, well, that's some kingdom principle down the road. No, Ephesians 4.31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. That's what it says. Colossians 3.8. But now you also put off all these anger wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Put them away. Put them off. That's what he's saying. There's also a priority over even a spiritual activity. He raises it above that. You know, you read the verse there. If you can offer your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you and you've got probably something against him, you better get that fixed. That's more important right now. Your relationships with one another are more important than your offering. Now we're not offering gifts at the altar, of course. They knew what that meant and we can relate to it in some way ourselves, spiritual activities. 
you know, we're all so nice at church when we hate our uh, sister over there, you know, three, three seats over. That's not right. We can't have that. In God's kingdom, it can't be that way. And so he draws, he draws, it, uh, he draws out that point and makes it very serious. How much more serious can you make it equating murder with anger? We, we, we don't care about anger. We, we hold it. You know, anger is very damaging to you physiologically, too. It causes heart attacks. It causes all kinds of uh, messed up hormone activity in your body. There's a whole lot of you can study on that. And so it's just not good practically for you. But is there a place for anger, for true, real anger? Well, you probably thought of the verse, Ephesians 4.26. Be ye angry, but sin not. Makes a distinction between anger and sinful anger. And so there is that sense. When Jesus was turning the tables over in the temple, he was angry. He was angry at the whole situation, that they would turn his house into a merchandise uh, place. And it, it clicked a spark in him, and he went in there, and he, and he took care of it. So, yes, there is a place for anger, but not sinful anger. And so we have to make that distinction. There's a, play, there's a time to be motivated by something when, and I, I studied a lot of where anger, the source of it is, is when what you feel is right is being violated, you become angry. Well, that could be a good thing. That could be a real good thing. Or it could be something that you just need to let go. So <clears throat> he says that. Jesus clearing out the temple was, uh, I know he's meek and lowly, but, but every now and then he uh, stepped up and did what had to be done. And he did it in, a, in a, a, a fit of anger. And that's why they said the zeal of his house has consumed him. It's taken over. We've never seen him like this. So hopefully it would be... Uh, not the, the everyday activity. So check your heart on that. Check your heart when you're driving around. Check your heart when you're encountering things that, that, that aren't right. And uh, give that to the Lord. So he talked about externals and internals. Then he talks about an action and then an intention. And he says there, You have heard it said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, we don't want to hear this at all, but that's what it says. Now, adultery is, is uh, sex outside of the confines of marriage. In fact, sex within the confines of someone else's marriage. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. It's, like, it's right up there with murder, right? But then he says that all you have to do is look at a woman with evil intent and you might commit adultery with her. No, you already have committed adultery. It's done. It's a done deal. And you know it is too. See, God is speaking with us. And he's, he's, he's um, enlightening people to things that they know is true, they know are true, but now he's bringing it into relief, into full view. He's just... He's just opening all the doors up to our hearts. And he's telling us the way we are. Where was this adultery committed? In the bedroom? No, it was committed in your heart. Your heart. Your heart is you. It's who you are. It's your soul. It's your being. It's, it's you. There's a beautiful uh, song Steve Green wrote called Guard Your Heart. And in that, there's a lyric, and he says, you must choose in advance. you got to know what's coming. Look at the severity with which he says. Jesus sometimes would speak in what we call hyperbole, you know, over the top. And here's one. He says, if your right hand, no, if your right eye, verse 29, causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Pretty blunt, huh? That's severe. And I don't know, men and maybe women, sometimes you have to be ruthless with your thought life, ruthless with your actions. 
it, essentially cutting off your hand and throwing it away. Uh, you know, you might understand the relationship there, but to the adultery with the hand. How about the eye? Pluck it out and throw it away. In other words, don't do that. Don't look there. You, you know what's out. You know what all of the watering holes are, where they could be. And Jesus is asking us and telling us, listen, this is serious business. Something you think you can get away with is actually like committing adultery in the real sense. And I don't know how much more clear Jesus says I can make it to you than that. And to get away from it, you have to be deadly serious with what goes on in your life. And I don't know where you are, if this is a, a bigger struggle for some than others. I think it's a struggle for everyone at some level, some more than others, and some because of a background or when you were saved, all of those things come to play. Jesus also said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries. Out of the heart. He's not talking about real murder there. He's talking about exactly what he's talking about here. That's where it comes from, and that's where it ends up in your heart internally. So something to think about there. Then, sort of related to that in a way, he starts talking about divorce and marriage. It seems, seems to flow right from one to the other. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of immorality, or it could say fornication in your uh, translation, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> is, that what it is that what it really says? Yes, that's what it really says. And you can read it in Matthew 19, Luke 16, Mark 10. This is a very controversial subject because we, we cannot bear to even believe that what he says is true. And we could have a long discussion about it, and some people have paid a price for their teaching on this, some people that I know that hold to it very strongly. I think what we can get from it, though, is that marriage is a high and holy covenant, not to be messed with. At least you can get that from it. It is a beautiful thing. And the charge there is to do everything you can to maintain it. Don't look for a way out. Look for every way to preserve it, if it gets to that point. They have what they call the exception clause. You might have read that somewhere. That's the except for the cause of fornication. So if your husband ends up becoming unfaithful, I'm just going to dump him and go find another guy. Don't do that. That's not how it works. Remember grace? Remember God's love for you? Plug that into your marriage relationship. The only reason divorce was permitted in the Mosaic system, Jesus told him, was because of the hardness of your heart. Your heart's the problem. But then he says, but from the beginning, it wasn't, it wasn't so. It's not like that. The very beginning covenant of marriage was a covenant, a permanent covenant. Marriage was a, uh, a reflection of God's never-ending love and commitment to his creation. And we have to see it that way. Of course, we don't see that in our world, do we? Even among Christians, uh, sadly. I want to read a passage which is, throws a little light on this too, out of Matthew, but I'm in 1 Corinthians 7 here, verses 10 and 11. And it says, To the married... I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, this is what the Lord has said, the wife should not separate from her husband. Okay, well, that's that. But then it says, but if she does, really? We're just going to violate the Lord's commandments? Yes, we do it all the time. Uh, married, the divorce is a 50%, I think, in overall. I heard the divorce rate in Utah is higher than any other place in the country, and they're supposed to have these high family values, but it doesn't work out. So the Lord says the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, 
In other words, if she disobeys the Lord, then she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. That's what it says. So then you'd ask, well, what if I do? Well, that's not covered here. But what we want to do is see marriage for what it is, a beautiful covenant and a relationship which is holy, which is honorable, which must be maintained at all costs. The human heart enters into these things, and it gets very complicated and sometimes very ugly. But at the end of the day, the best choice you can make is to maintain your marriage. Forget the exception clause. Forget anything. Look to the Lord and maintain that relationship. Then he talks about relationships with God. <clears throat> and here we get down to oaths, down to verse 33. Again, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, or by Jerusalem. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than that comes from evil. What's that all about? I think it speaks to the sincerity of our relationship with the Lord in our committing things to Him. And we do things. We, 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 we've had a lot of talk of goals and, and visions and objectives. Well, you commit those to the Lord. Those are kind of like oaths and vows. So it might be talking about taking the Lord's name in vain, like uh, Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments. But that verse, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, it doesn't mean uh, like as a swear word, which I've heard a lot, but it really means saying something for the Lord like, well, I swear to God I'll be there, and then you're not there. That's taking the, names, the name of the Lord in vain. You're giving something to him, and then you're, you're, you're not doing it. Totally wrong. You, you'd be better off not saying a thing than to do something like that. That's what, he's, that's what he means. Uh, Numbers 30, verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. That's, that's the real deal there. That's the vow that you want to have and that you do it unto the Lord. I want to read a passage along those lines in Ecclesiastes, which talks quite a bit about this as well. And I'm in chapter 5, just 1 through 6. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin. Do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? It's the same thought there. In fact, maybe the Lord was actually thinking of that passage in Ecclesiastes. So when we have our relationship with the Lord, we should bring things to him. We should commit our family to him. We should commit our parenting to him. We should commit our, our uh, fellowship to him and all of these things. And then we should do it. We should walk in those things that we commit to the Lord. And he'll bless those things like we looked at that wonderful reciprocal blessing we saw in the Beatitudes. So he's not saying, no, just, just don't do a thing, just zip up. No, he's saying, do what you say you're going to do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And that's it. How many words are thrown around these days, especially in this town, about Jesus this and in the name of Jesus? And no, that, these, are all, these are all just uh, foolish vows. Let's, let's be consistent. Let's be disciplined in committing things to the Lord and then seeing him work through us that we can accomplish those things that we commit to him. Agreed? Then our relationship with God, then he moves to our relationship with others. And these last two points 
are very much that. You have heard, this is verse 38 now of Matthew 5, we're back in Matthew. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him take your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile with him, go two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse to the one from, uh, who would borrow from you. What's that say? That we should just kind of uh, back off and let everybody just be a, let us be a punching bag for everybody's uh, injustices? Not exactly. But just think if we live that way, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that every injustice ever done to me would be paid back in full and maybe double paid back, and we'd feel much better that way, right? I'll get you twice as bad. That, that, that's the world. Remember, my kingdom is not of this world. That's how the world deals with conflicts. They double down. You see it in government right now. You say one thing against this government, we're coming at you. You can expect the FBI to be there in no time. That's not, that's not God's kingdom. He's saying there, listen, this is, this is what we said in the legal system, but this is not the way we're going to live now. Not the way we're going to live. Basically, he's saying there are times where you have to take the hit and then just tell God about it. How many times have you been defrauded, uh, maybe not paid back when you should have been, or somebody changed, changed the rules on you, and they said, no, it really wasn't like this. And, and you just, Mary and I have had to do it many times. You just stand back and say, okay, all right. I'm not going to, Lord, that's, that's on them. You take care of that. I like doing that. I like to say, Lord, you do that. I could do that. I could come back, uh, you know, TP their house and, uh, you know, spray paint their driveway or something. But no, Lord, you do that. I'm not going to retaliate in that sense. Paul says it in uh, 1 Corinthians. He says, now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. This would be a Christian to another Christian. Why not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? He's saying that would be better than getting your oath, your, you know, getting what you think is coming to you. Every now and then, we're not supposed to, you know, sometimes we have to defend ourselves. Sometimes we have to stand up against injustice. I get that. Jesus gets that. But sometimes you, you, cannot, you cannot just fight every battle and have everything just, I'm going to get you back twice as bad as you got me, and I'll feel good about it. That's not kingdom living in the day-to-day. I want to be like Jesus, don't you? Amen. He said, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Here's the beautiful part. But committed himself to him that judges righteously. I might not judge correctly, because I'm, I'm messed up in my head. But he always judges correctly. So I'd rather commit it to the, the perfect judge who can move all the pieces in a way that will satisfy his justice, and I can stay out of the, out of the mix. Just commit it to the Lord sometimes when things are right. This might not just be uh, worldly things. It could be difficult things in your life. You just commit things to the Lord. Say, Lord, I can't fix this. I'm not going to fix this. You fix it. And I guess it kind of gets to vows again, doesn't it? All these sort of relate in a way. So I want to be like Jesus in this one. I don't want to just uh, get run over all the time. But I just want to say no. Lord, you know what's going on. You know my heart. You know what happened. And I'm just going to give it to you and move on. I'll take the hit this time. And then lastly, and so beautifully, in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Well, that's a high bar right there, to pray for your enemies. 
And the result is that you become sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, we are children. We had that Bible study uh, a couple nights ago, and it says, now you are the children of God. So that doesn't change. This doesn't make you a son. But it creates that working relationship that a son would have with his father, that we would be praying for our enemies, praying for those who despitefully use us. God shows his goodness to everyone, doesn't he? He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Your enemy gets his garden water too, <laughs> because God is that good. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a cutoff point to his goodness to your enemy, because he must trust the Lord and, and uh, recognize his presence and his love and his forgiveness. But in a sense, God shows his goodness to everyone, and in that sense, we need to as well. We need to understand that the people that we're having a hard time with, that God loves them more than we do, apparently, and we need to be more like him and less like us. We need to see the, I, I try to think of this when I'm in, in a public setting. I look around at people, and I, I want to see their soul. They have a soul like me. And not just pass them by. It gets, gets into evangelism. They have, they have a life. Everyone has a story. If you knew their story, you might not think about them the way you do. Remember we talked about being the light of the world. Being that thing that is shining something into the darkness. Being the salt of the earth. Being that, that flavor that people sense and know. That's who we want to be in the kingdom. So... Living in the kingdom day to day is living and walking, demonstrating the virtues and characteristics of it to the world around us. They should see it in us. And they don't see everything because they can't see your heart. But your heart, God is seeing. He knows your heart. And your heart has to be pure. Remember, we talked about that in that last message. One of the Beatitudes was pureness of heart. That's motive. And so... All of these things, these, these very hard things in our life that we face every day, uh, lust and, and anger, and don't say it doesn't happen, it does happen. We need to recognize it for what it is. It's part of the fallen condition. You know, you're not going to get away from this fallen state. The sooner you recognize that, the better off you'll be. You are a fallen creature in a sense, and you will get through this world constantly renewing your mind, renewing your heart, Focusing on those things that are good, putting away the things that are bad. That's just the way it is. That's the life you will be living. How well are you living it is the question. And I want to look at this in our Wednesday study about, about the, the identity in Christ, the heart, the mind. What is the new nature? Do we have a sinful nature? Let's, let's have a discussion on those things and, and look at that more carefully. Now, you might... Remember in one of our studies, I read out of the message translation, which was the uh, monosodium glutamate <laughs> translation, the MSG <laughs> translation, and it took some of these passages and, and did what it does in that other passage we looked at. Looking at the verse that said, uh, you're, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, it said, in a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. You're kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. I like that. In a word, what I'm saying, grow up. You're living in a kingdom with a king and resources at your disposal to live for him in a way that pleases him. It, it's enough to say, well, I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And I'm, well, what about the higher things? What about your heart? What about these things that God is, that, that God is treasuring, the, uh, the attitude of your heart towards others? So think about these things. These are familiar passages. These are, a couple of these are very controversial passages. But there's, there's a deep meaning there. there there's a higher bar that God is calling us to. And again, I want to repeat what I said in the beginning. We are not under law. 
we are not under law principles that if I do this and this and this and this, God's pleased with me. God is asking you. He's calling you to a higher place. It's like children. And I, I think I mentioned this. Young children, it's, it's very legal. You have to do this now. Later, as they get older, you can't, you can't approach them that way. You have to approach them with the principles of things. Here's why this is the right thing to do. Like, say, say they get caught stealing. We have to tell them it's not enough to say, don't steal anymore. No, here's what happens when you, you know, you, that's a higher principle. That's, what, that's where we are here. He's teaching his subjects in his kingdom and teaching us today to live at a higher level of morality than maybe we're used to living. He's calling us to a higher bar, and he's enabling us to do that very thing, and that's what we want to do. So review some of these passages. Uh, maybe uh, some of these have uh, touched your heart a little bit. I know they have mine, obviously. And um, let us be perfect as our Heavenly pa Father is perfect. Perfect there means finished or complete. It doesn't mean perfection like we might think of it, like no flaw. Not that God has a flaw, but be perfect in the sense of be complete. Be that, be that one that he wants you to be in your actions. And that may be anger, that may be lust, that may be understanding your relationship with your brother. I don't know. But all of these things touch upon us sometime, somewhere. And so let's be sensitive to that and, and recognize his power in us to live for him.